just two questions, one more personal, one professional. The professional question is, what do you think the major challenges are going to be in the future? You've done a lot over your career. And what are the pressing concerns? Now, I'm more of a data science, cybersecurity person. I started my career in networking, but really didn't continue with it. So what are some of the networking challenges? Are the, I mean, now we are talking about 5G, 6G, 7G. Are those the challenges or what are the other challenges? Okay, so um, yeah, about five or 10 years ago, if you um, asked me about the internet, I would have waxed rhapsodic about how it's changed society. Um, you know, you can keep in touch with people all over the world. You can buy widgets from all over the world. You can um, have a business without having a storefront and reach, uh, you can get education, um, you know, everything is at your fingertips. But these days, um, I think it is basically the end of society, the end of truth as we know it. So, um, you know, like we have all this wonderful cryptography to help us. So, um, you know, you can digitally sign things so you know who injected it. And that might make sense if it's the New York Times. Um, but these days, everybody is a reporter. Every teenager with a cell phone because you can't have the Channel 4 news crew be at the site where news is happening. Mm -hmm. So you can't tell whether something's true or not based on the source because they're all sort of anonymous sources. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just terrifying. You know, is there any way that we can preserve the power of the internet for good without having it destroy civilization? Another sort of interesting thing that um, I noticed recently was again, um, we all know exactly, we've solved all the problems of how to communicate securely on the web. So if you wanna to talk to Bank of America, um, you, you contact bankofamerica.com and it sends you a certificate and you have all this wonderful, um, um, you know, crypto and protocols, and then you can have an authenticated conversation. Well, that's the theory. Um, in reality, I was actually taken in by a scam recently, which was that I wanted to renew my Washington State driver's license. So I don't know the URL. I typed into Google, um, renew Washington State license. And so I got a bunch of results and I clicked on the top one because that's always the right thing. Had I bothered looking at the DNS name in this huge URL, it was something that looked reasonable like WashingtonLicensing.org. And I clicked on it, got this beautiful website that had a bunch of sort of pretty stock photo um, uh, pictures of people really happy, you know, like get a new license, replace your license. So I clicked on renew license and um, it asked me everything I expected, my driver's license number, my address and my credit card number. And I thought I'd succeeded. Um, now, I never did get a license, but I, I wouldn't have even sort of noticed until I checked up you know, a month later why I never got the license. But the bank fraud department called me up and said, are these legitimate charges? And this site had charged me $3.99 the first day, $9.99 the second day, $19.99. And that was when the bank fraud department called me. And I explained um, what had happened. And they said, oh, yeah, that's fine. And they um, uh, disallowed the charges and gave me a new credit card number. So I wasn't harmed in any way, but I really cherish this example because it shows that all of this stuff, when we concentrate on all of the academic type details, if you actually look at the whole system, there's absolutely no security there. And I claim I as a human did nothing wrong. Um, so how can you achieve this? You know, how can you make things actually usable? So I'm, I'm not sure I remember the question anymore. <laughs> That's but, yeah. Yeah. But I also have a second part because it's a mentor. You, you answered my question because it was, you know, the getting the truth out. That's the major challenge. The second part of the question, more personal, since it's a mentoring, I mentor workshop. Did you have a mentor 
And how did the mentors, mentor or mentors, how did the mentor help you in your career? I didn't really have one. I, I sort of wasn't in the sort of old boys club or, or whatever you want to call it. I was kind of astonished when I was, um, I didn't know anything about National Academy of Engineering. Um, you never hear about who it was that nominated you, but mm -hmm. I suspect it was Misha Schwartz, um, you know, and I only got to meet him like at the induction thing. And I, I thanked him, but I, you know, I didn't ask him whether he was the person, but um, yeah, I mean, I have sort of peers um, that I talk to, but I haven't had any sort of really senior person that has, you know, tried to help me and give me advice and stuff. Yeah. Um, so it could, it could yeah. be because, this is my theory, because you are so brilliant that maybe you didn't really, no, I'm not trying to flatter you. I just, you know, I, I was reading up on you and even before that maybe you didn't really need a mentor in the sense that you were there, you didn't go for positions, you were just there based on your technical um, brilliance that people sort of recognized you. Maybe that might have been the reason. Well, maybe, maybe I would have done, you know, better sooner or whatever. Um, yeah. And I've had a lot of, you know, really discouraging things. So like I, I had invented this other thing fairly recently called Trill, which um, I had to fight with the standards bodies for it. It was, it was a way of making, I, I, you know, kind of to my horror, spanning tree ethernet still exists. And this was a way of making it so that you really would have optimal paths and you would have a hop count and stuff. Um, but I just couldn't really, I, I'm, yeah, I'm conflict diverse. And there are uh, people in the standards body that are just bullies and they really do anything possible to undermine me. So I sort of, um, you know, gave up on trying to do things in the standards body. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. I have a question. Oh, well, the Efron go first and then Yago second. Okay, thank you. So, um, I'm, I just want to say it's, it's such an honor, an honor to meet you, um, Radia. Uh, you're a legend, and I enjoyed the talk very much. And <clears throat> my question is, um, if you ever look back at uh, the legacy of STP or ISIS, and, you know, because, uh, I mean, I was a, a network engineer at some point, and I had to configure STP. And, you know, it's, it's been using millions of devices, and by and it's been uh, used by millions of engineers. So do you ever look back on, uh, at that and, and what do you make of that uh, legacy, I guess? Well, yeah, I'm sort of astonished um, kind of how successful these things were, especially Spanning Tree, which was supposed to be a short-term kludge until people fixed the endnotes to put layer three in. And today, that it, basically when you say ethernet, it's, it's Spanning Tree stuff. Um, yeah, I don't think at this point um, it would be as easy to, um, well, I don't know, maybe if you're at a huge company like Google or something, it might be possible um, to cause something to happen. But yeah, fighting in the standards bodies is, is kind of very frustrating. Um, I actually wrote a paper recently about you know, decisions that I thought were really bad that the networking people had done, but good things that came out of it that wouldn't have otherwise. So for instance, um, it was sort of inexcusable that in 1992, when they realized that IPv4, the addresses were too small, um, people said, well, why don't you just use the 20 byte address that ISO has, um, which, Actually, not only was it big enough, but it actually is different in important ways that make it better than IPv6 would ever be, even if we could get there. But also it would have been so easy to, um, to migrate to the bigger address in, in 1992. But again, it was all the not invented here. We don't wanna give the other standards body the satisfaction of admitting that anything they did was worthwhile. Um, but had we gone to that, 
we wouldn't have invented these kludges that turn out to be wonderful, like network address translators, which, um, you know, everyone loves to hate them, but the concept of having um, an, a local address in your network that nobody can reach you unless you talk outwards is, is actually a wonderful thing. So um, we wouldn't have needed it. I mean, you can use it with um, the ISO 20 byte thing, but we probably wouldn't have invented it because we didn't need it. Um, you know, anyway, so uh, that, that's sort of some of my thinking about these things that it's sort of very interesting um, looking at an alternate history. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and actually I think uh, um, network correlation is, uh, is one of the reasons that we haven't deployed uh, IPv6, uh, you know, more. Um, in, because you know it's been like ten years since they uh, started deployed IPv6, um, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Well, people think that it's because of NATs that you don't have IPv6, um, and so they. But you know they do things like let's sabotage NATs. Let's not allow people to document how they work. And um, uh, um, that will sabotage them somehow. But when you're trying, since they're a reality, it's very hard to design things. So I was, you know, designing something with the IPsec that you needed to know how the NATs worked, but no one documented it. So um, anyway, it, it, there's a lot of reasons sort of why they um, haven't really migrated to IPv6. Um, and there was a really good case. Um, um, somebody wrote a paper recently about how there's nothing you can get with IPv6 that you can't get with IPv4 plus NATS. So, okay, yeah. I'll have to look for that paper. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, oh, it was Jeff Houston. Um, uh, Jeff. That, that should help you do a search for it. And it might have only been a talk, not a paper, but I think it was a paper. Send me email if you have trouble finding it. Okay. And somebody else had a question they were going to ask? Uh, yeah. First, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Uh, I'm curious about what do you think are the, like, the major differences between uh, being an engineer and being a scientist? Like previously, I might think like engineers work is mainly about implementation and then keep write, writing code. But I'm really, really impressed by your talk. Like you invent those kind of fantastic um, algorithms and uh, it's almost like an art and you lay the foundations to this uh, advanced technique. So I really want to hear from you that uh, what do you think, like how to shine as an engineer? Right, so I actually use the term interchangeably. I think that, um, you know, an engineer isn't sort of a mindless, um, you know, just, just someone tells you the spec and you write the code, um, you should really sort of understand what you're doing um, and also be able to invent things. Um, I actually think the traditional engineers and the traditional academics should talk to each other more because sometimes the academics go march off into bizarre things that nobody needs but there winds up being this small community of maybe 10 people that all cite each other's papers. And other than getting papers, um, you know, there, there's no real impact. Yeah. Thank you. Great question, yeah. Any other questions uh, from the audience? And I, I want to just very quickly ask uh, Aridia, um, it, you know, you mentioned about the IETF bodies. You know, the 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 frustration that you you had um, regarding you know their certain attitude, you know, biases, and then you know just similar situations. So how, how did you handle stress? So what, you know, do you do like do yoga or you know um, any any ways that you resolve those kind of things? You know, like you cannot directly solve the problem, um, but then you sort of. Um, help yourself um, get used to the situation, um, you know, talk to family members. So, you know, what any suggestions? 
Right. So I could lie to you and I, I could say, well, I do yoga or something. That, that's completely not true. Uh, the real answer is a lot of sleepless nights, crying a lot. Um, you know, I, it, it's just very frustrating. I have this belief that life should be fair and people that are really obnoxious bullies should not get ahead. Um, but life isn't fair and you sort of have to get used to it's never gonna be fair. Um, and I, even though intellectually I know that, you know, in, emotionally, I, it's just still really difficult for me. So, I, you know, I try to have a sense of humor. Um, I do have sort of a, um, you know, an awesome relationship with my significant other. Uh, sort of 24 hours a day is not enough time to spend with each other. Um, you know, the only, um, I, I see couples and, and when they're not happy, I, I sort of try to analyze what's wrong. You know, one of the things I say is you should never criticize each other. So I see these couples that, you know, it's like, hey, you're getting fat. Um, you know, why are you not nicer to me? And you can never get out of that mode, especially by you know, more and more criticisms. So, um, yeah, I, the only criticism I've ever given of him was one time when he was hugging me, I said, I wish you had more arms. You know, it's... <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Your job in sort of a relationship is to build the other people up, build up their self-confidence, help them be successful at what they want to be successful at. Um, you know, and when they open up the door and come home, they should feel like the sun is out, they can relax and whatever. So yeah, having an awesome relationship helps a lot. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that intimate detail. <laughs> so we really appreciate it. In, in, so, I mean, I mean it's, this is also goes back to your your algorithm, uh, it's, it's a very artistic person. <laughs> and on top of being a, a great engineer, um, and I myself, uh, just very quickly, I myself, uh, I know we're running out of time. I, I, I have your recording. I'm gonna do a lot of publicity. I also want to share a shorter versions of it with our undergraduate students and even with my daughter's high school class and they are doing uh, uh, computer science uh, AP classes. And, and so there's a lot of girls who would benefit from a great talk. Um, and, and so I in, um, really appreciate your thoughtfulness in putting together the, the, the keynote. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, uh, we, we could, oh, I could and, ask um, so many more, sorry. Yeah, so many oh, more I'll be um, um, hanging around. So oh, if great, you want to ask me questions, yeah, um, you know, like in the chat, in the chat yeah. you can um, either do it to everybody and, um, or you could send a chat just to me. And either way, I'll try to answer great. these Thank questions. Thank you so I'm much. I'm sorry, I was Yeah, but Babani, what, what you're trying to say? No, I said I could ask so many more questions, but I'll just stop at that.